My name is Laura Ciceri. I'm the founder of Supply Chain Insights, and I love telling customer stories of how companies use technology and business processes to drive results. Today, I'm interviewing Jeff Seitz, and Jeff and I go way back, and I'm proud to say he's now the CEO, and he has taken on a new job, and it is really paying off for Bubbies as Bubbies tries to recreate the market in the ice cream novelty market. So Jeff, you're one of my favorite supply chain leaders. <laughs> Tell the group a little bit about yourself and why you decided to come to Bubbies and drive change transformation. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I've uh, done supply chain roles for about the last 30 years and, and you know, starting out in a traffic center at Frito-Lay and then working with some really world-class companies at Dryer's Grand Ice Cream and Diamond Foods, Mary's Gone Crackers. And then I took a break after Mary's and decided to do some consulting. And I had an opportunity to come and help uh, Bubby's uh, work through a challenging time uh, for the company when, when I first got here. A lot of growth uh, trying to get a plant stood up, a lot of challenges with people in roles that just didn't have all of the support that they needed to really be successful. So came in as a consultant and helped them get production planning under control. And and as sometimes happens with consulting assignments, one thing leads to another and you find that you're a pretty good fit for the company. And I moved into the chief operating officer role in November of 2020 and moved into the CEO role in February of last year. Uh, so it's been a really good experience. There's a, definitely a benefit to growing up with a supply chain background because you work across all the different functions of the business. I got to spend some time as a chief information officer when I was at Diamond. Again, another good experience because you have to work across the entire company as well as work with external partners. Uh, I think my background, especially over the last 10 or 15 years, really put me in a good position to bring some value to the role that I'm in today. So, Jeff. And many companies are in larger technology, corporate mm -hmm. structures, and a lot of your time has been spent with what I would consider a small and medium-sized company. Right. What's required for leadership in a small and medium-sized company as you think about really driving forward? There's definitely a need to uh, be able to understand all the different functions of the business at, at a greater level than when you're in a larger company and there's, there's plenty of people, there's, there's breadth and depth in larger companies. And in smaller companies, there's more breadth sometimes than there is depth. And so I think it's been helpful to have in a lot of uh, team roles, uh, as well as individual contributor roles, to really understand the work that's being done and the work that needs to be done. A lot of times in smaller companies, systems are in place that get by, uh, but don't really optimize. And so I think having that background has helped me identify the areas that we need to optimize in and we need to step up and be able to do more in. And I think all of that experience was helpful in terms of being able to get to that point. Yeah, I find that in smaller companies, it's not as political, it's more yeah. focused because people can align better to the customer. But, you know, leadership really matters because not as much capital, not as much, you know, margin for error. And so making the right decisions really matter. And when you think about bubbies and you think about creating what I consider to be a relatively new category, right, you know, right. what was really required for leadership there? And tell me a little bit about it. The product is an awesome product. It's, it's absolutely on trend in terms of portion control, in terms of portability. You know, a lot of the things that we're seeing in terms of frozen novelty development are in that, in that regard, stick bars, uh, mochi, uh, ice cream sandwiches. So I, we are absolutely on point and at the right time in the frozen novelty uh, market. And that helps. It also helps that we're a super premium product. So people, when they're looking for an indulgent experience, don't want to, they don't want to compromise on that. And so our ice cream is super premium ice cream. Um, and our mochi dough is a very well-developed product. We spent a lot of time and work getting our mochi dough to be the best that it can possibly be. And I think the combination of those have led to a lot of success in the marketplace. Now, 
I had one the other day and they taste really, really good. <laughs> and uh, many people may not know what a mochi is and may even not say it correctly, but <laughs> it started in a Y, right? So how did it start? And, you know, how did the category develop? So the founder uh, started in Hawaii and started as an ice cream maker. And that follows through to us today. I mean, we spend a lot of time making sure that we get the ice cream right. And then he became aware of this Japanese dessert treat called mochi and set out to be able to make it on his own and crafted his own dough recipe, which we still follow for the most part today. We've obviously scaled it up significantly from the small operation that he had in Hawaii, but it started out as a very local product with a lot of, with a very strong local following. We still have a very strong customer base in Hawaii. And that's, that's really helped us uh, as we've continued to uh, develop the product. It's always important to remember where your product came from and what made it successful in the beginning. And I think we've really done a good job of focusing on the quality. We have, you know, as, as inflation has beset a lot of categories, you know, we have the opportunity to maybe not use Madagascar vanilla or not care so much about where our mangoes come from, but we have not backed off on that at all. And, and we're not going to back off on that. The, the ingredient quality is built into our products and it'll remain that way. And I think that's, I think that focus on quality and that focus on making sure that our ingredients are right has really helped us a lot. Well, and I think it's easier at a leadership level to be customer centric and to be in connection with the customer and such a fun ride as a startup. Now, tell me a little bit about your company. How many people uh, and uh, what are the geographies just to give the audience some scope? Sure. We're based in Phoenix, Arizona, and our manufacturing distribution and corporate offices are all located here in Phoenix. And We have about 120 people on any given day, and about 80 of those are manufacturing related and the rest are sales, marketing, logistics related. It's a fairly small team, and the team's been together for uh, about three or or four years. So the group has uh, good chemistry, and we've been able to get a lot accomplished with a relatively small group of people. The real attitude of flowing to the work here that absolutely helps. So if it's a particularly busy day from an order standpoint, we have logistics people that are cross-trained that can go dispatch trucks or can help get trucks loaded or make sure that things get shipped on time or received on time. So that's been that that's a real uh, strong attribute for the company. Um, and we've also used we've we've not been afraid to reach out and pull expertise in from the outside when we need to. If it's packaging related, you know we have relationships with packaging engineering experts. If it's dough related, we have relationships with people that do dough for a living. So we've the the team has been really good about accepting help from the outside when we need it, as well as developing our people up uh, from the inside so that they're ready to go when we as we continue to grow as we get to the next stage. We've got people that are ready to step into those roles. Well, let's get into your story, Jeff. So you got your first 90 days Mm -hmm. and you've been a consultant at this company, but you had some alignment issues, right? Uh, And you had to really be sure that you were using capital appropriately. Tell me about the first 90 days and how you really went about putting your stamp or your mark or creating the right culture that we really needed to do was just to get focused on on what we were going to be focused on. Uh, and, and that really boiled down to four things that continue to be true today. And one of the biggest challenges we had was just getting people comfortable that we'd meet our financial commitments. I have a board of directors that we're responsible for. We have lenders that we're responsible to, uh, employees that we are you know responsible for and responsible to. And so Making sure that we were in the right position to meet our financial commitments consistently every month was something that we really needed to get good at quickly. And on top, on top of that, we had to pick our battles in terms of building brand equity, in terms of getting our sales team focused, in terms of exactly what accounts we were going to go after. And because we've been capacity constrained, we had to really step up our game in terms of that area. So we spent some time making sure that everybody was aligned around those four things and that everybody understood how they supported them. Building brand equity is not just a marketing phrase. It has to do with product quality. It has to do with how we treat our customers. 
sales focus isn't just the sales team. It's when we're going to run an event at a major customer, making sure that we have product available and that we don't miss deadlines, we don't miss commitments. So each one of these key priority areas required cross-functional effort in order for us to be really good at them. And again, this flow to the work, you know, there's certain times when building brand equity may be more important than sales focus. But as a leadership team, we've been good about being flexible and getting people in the right place at the right time to be able to deliver on those. The second big thing was just getting the relationships and partnerships established. Uh, as CEO, you definitely have a lot more external focus uh, than you do as the chief operating officer. That tends to be more internally focused. So I had some work to do to get those relationships built and set up. Um, and then the last part of it was just making sure that we really leveled up our sales and operations planning process because we were capacity constrained and we were growing and we were adding customers. Having a feasible plan made sure that ever made sure that all four of those key priority areas got addressed. So financial commitments mean different things to different people. Yeah. What are you measuring? Primarily, we were measuring um, our performance to our a monthly budget plan, that that was a big thing because if we started to miss or if we couldn't explain our performance on a monthly basis, that didn't build confidence. <laughs> so for us, that was the primary thing. And again, a business this size, it's cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. <laughs> so we really needed to pay attention to, you know, are we making the right investments in inventory, both raw materials and finished goods? Are we, are we getting the cash pulled together that we need to self-fund some of our capital improvements? It's just you know, constraints exist in several different places. Capital's a constraint, cash is a constraint, and capacity was a constraint. So part of my role is to make sure that we're addressing each one of those appropriately. And I think we did a good job of that the past year. So sales and operations planning is definitely an enabler there, but mm -hmm. give me a little bit of color about what it's like to be in the novelty industry, because <laughs> you and I come from cold chain yeah. and, then, you know, we've worn the boots and the gloves and chipped the ice off the floor, but, you know, cold chain distribution has its own nuances, right? Yes, that's very true. And, and uh, warehouse space is extremely expensive. Transportation is extremely expensive. So there's not much of a return on investment for building out warehouse space. So our capital planning and our production planning have to be aligned so that we're adding production resources appropriately so we don't have to build additional cold storage locations. So we upgraded our local cold storage, um, got ourselves really well in position at the end of 2019, but that's all of the warehouse space that we're going to have in Phoenix. You know, we're not going to build more warehouse space here. So that's put a lot of pressure on the sales and operations planning process to make sure that big customer events that we have, that we're able to keep our manufacturing rates at, at the appropriate level, that we continue to invest improvements in throughput in the plant because that saves us from having to build warehouse space. But as the time is right, you know, we'll look to put another dot on the map and, and get product closer to our customer base as opposed to having it all be in Phoenix. So when you were a consultant, you reached out to me and you asked me some questions about what are good technologies for sales and operations planning for small, medium-sized companies yes. to really drive a feasible plan. And I'm excited to see that you took my advice, right? That uh, <laughs> you implemented Optimity and uh, tell me a little bit about the experience. Yes, I remember uh, getting a note from you saying you need to you need to call Mark Walker and talk to him. <laughs> and I did take your advice on that. And we looked at a couple of uh, different options for, you know, being able to move from spreadsheet models into a more integrated planning system. My role as a consultant was to get the right options in front of the team that was going to have to actually work in the system, but to leave the decision making process to them. It's important that, you know, I, I don't dictate the, the solution outcome uh, because I'm not the one that's going to have to be in it every day. And so the team did a really good job of going through the selection process. Optimity did a great job of coming in and, and helping educate the team and really spent the time with the team uh, to make sure that they knew what they were getting into. And in the background, we were working to make sure that we had a system that was going to connect to our ERP system effectively. Um, we don't have an IT department here or managed service provider, you know, uh, based. So we needed something that was going to be able to work on the back end as well as it was going to work in, in front of the users. 
So Optimity exceeded all of our expectations for that. The, the team you know, worked through this decision pretty quickly. And then within 60 days, we were up and running with our initial look at our forecast and our, our production models out of Optimity. I think it's worth repeating within 60 days. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I go um, back to the old million dollar implementation projects with Manugistics and some other solutions. Uh, so 60 days uh, with the investment that we made was a really good outcome to have. You know, a lot of times people that are in your shoes want to have solutions that they hear a lot about in the market. And, you know, they'll look at other analyst reports that take certain companies because maybe they have higher market share or they've been in the market longer and give them higher ratings. But, you know, as a mid-market company and someone that's trying to go after growth and really dealing with a lot of constraints, you don't have a lot of time and you got to have a feasible plan. How did Optimity do on giving you a feasible plan? Really well um, in terms of almost from the beginning, we were getting plans that our production planner could look at and go, that's very similar to what I've got in my, in my spreadsheet model. And that's really the most critical confidence point is making sure that a production planner can look at the output from an integrated system and be able to tie it back to what's in their spreadsheet model, or at least understand where the different, you know, why things are different. Sometimes it's easier with production planning teams to use a spreadsheet because they can see how all the math works. Even if the math is incorrect, they can at least see how all the math works. And when you move to an integrated system like, like Optimity, you don't always see all the calculations in there. But that's where the consulting side on Optimity and the implementation side on Optimity was so good was it helped build that confidence with the production planners that they, that they understood why it was recommending that we worked on a Saturday or why it was taking the plant down for two weeks. And that was really helpful to be able to build the confidence. If you never cross the line and build the confidence with your production planners, then the system sits on the shelf and they go back to their spreadsheet models. And uh, it's a big watch out. The, the other watch out is that you, could, you can teach technology or you can teach process, but it's very difficult to teach them both at the same time. And so by starting with a spreadsheet model, we were actually able to teach process first. By the time we got to Optimity, we had that pretty well under our belt and we were able to put it in play with the integrated system much more effectively. Now, just for the audience, how many planners did you have? We have three people working in the system today. And a lot of times people make a mistake of buying technology, putting technology in, but not really verifying that it's a good plan and <laughs> not really verifying that you've got the right, I guess, confidence by the employees right. to use it. So how did you build that confidence? And, and when you ask three different people what's a good plan, sometimes you'll get three different answers. And so one of the challenges we had was the CFO wasn't really well connected to the spreadsheet models that were in play in production. And we had a revenue plan that came out of a sales spreadsheet and a production plan that came out of an operations spreadsheet and a financial plan that came out of the CFO's office. So a good plan meant different things to different people. A good plan for the plant meant I need to know how many Saturdays I'm going to work and I need to, you know, I need to be able to know what my labor requirements are going to be. That was a good plan from a, from a production standpoint, but it didn't take into account cash flow constraints that we might have that the CFO can see. So one of the early things that we did was we gave the CFO the keys to the process and said, you've got a bunch of questions about how this thing works and about what the output is. So you run the SNOP meeting. And, you know, one of the challenges of being the CEO is you can't put your thumb on the scale sometimes, you know, you've got to let people, especially with my background, it would be easy for me to go in and say, what about this? What about that? But, you know, the learning really had to occur within the group. And so we gave him the keys to the process and he's done a great job with it. And we're a lot more seamless now in terms of having conversations about what's going on in the demand side. He understands fully why we're building inventory, or we can at least have that discussion ahead of time before we start building the inventory and actually spending the cash. We are able to get alignment much earlier in the process. 
and, and that's played out in a couple of really key areas. We had a customer come to us with a significant opportunity once we loaded it into Optimity with everything else that we had in the demand plan, we were able to quickly point out that it wasn't going to work. We, we weren't going to be able to completely service it. And so because we found it five months in advance, our sales team was able to go work with that customer, change the timing, get it put into a window that did work. And we were able to service all of our requirements that way, not just one for a major customer. So I think that's where, you know, this has been the most effective sales and operations planning process I've ever been a part of. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're just getting alignment a lot earlier between the key functions of the business. And, and we've had to make some changes in terms of how those functions have thought about success as it relates to this process. And um, we can talk about that as well. Well, but the key here, I think, is that you have a feasible plan. So yeah. one that people buy into. And the second is you have visibility of what can actually be done. Uh, because that al- those two are very, very key for driving alignment. And 80% of companies don't have a feasible plan. So they're, they may be planning, but it's out of sync with what's available in terms of cash flow or capital or materials. And because yeah. it's not really feasible, they can't drive alignment because they keep failing. Yeah. And I think the fact that you built success out of building a feasible plan, validating it and improving the reliability allowed you to not only manage your financial commitments, which most people think about, but also drive a growth strategy so that company that came to you, that retailer that wanted your product, right? You could tell them when you could deliver it. That's exactly right. Yes. And, And it's the first time in my career where sales and operations planning actually drove you know, the, the addition of a new customer. And, and there's nothing better for that group uh, than to know that because of the work that they did and because of their ability to get aligned and deliver the plan, we, d- we were able to add a significant new customer as a result of that. So, you know, a lot of times sales and operations planning processes can be self-fulfilling one direction or the other. I think in this case, because we were able to reset some expectations functionally, and be able to really get this group aligned around what that feasible plan was, that allowed the success that then reinforces, right, that we're doing the right work. If I've been in other situations where the functions never got out of their own functional priorities, right, where sales would always have to beat their plan, you know, it's like we always have to beat our plan. Okay, well, what happens when you're constrained is if sales is over, always over delivering the number, then inventory never catches up, right? You never, you never get ahead because you're always forecasting a lower demand number than what you're actually seeing. And so that's some of the resetting of expectations we had to do. We had to convince the sales organization it was okay every once in a while to not make your number. You know, I need to see, I don't need to see bias in that demand estimate. I need to see pluses and minuses in that. It's okay for the production team to move up their units per day forecast because it, it, again, gives us a more feasible plan. Under promise and over deliver is a great thing to say, but it doesn't have any place in sales and operations planning. We're in supply chain. And That's the correct. other thing yeah. is maintenance is so important. And if you don't take care of those assets, then you end up with all kinds of other problems, right? Huge opportunity for us just in terms of being able to not only the equipment, but more importantly, the people. Six-day schedules are really difficult. You know, seven-day schedules, the dairy has its own sanitation requirements. You know, there's a lot of challenges in terms of making sure that people are getting as much downtime as the equipment's getting downtime. But absolutely, you know, the company saw some of that here earlier when they were trying to get things ramped up about what happens when, you know, you run equipment too long and you don't pay attention to the maintenance and you don't have, now you're in a situation where you've got a lot of unplanned downtime and unda- unplanned downtime is a, is a killer. Unplanned absences are a killer. And you can, we could have been able to avoid a lot of that because we've been able to protect and maintain those planned downtime events. Well, it sounds like a story of sweet success, so to speak, <laughs> and uh, bringing us delicious new novelties you know, for us to enjoy. 
You know, when you think about your journey of good plans, deliver results, and, you know, really being sure that you enable the process, the satisfaction of your employees, you know, this is the month of Valentine's Day and (laughs) the people that are the least satisfied in the supply chain space are the planners. Yeah. And I write a blog every year about give your planners some love. So I think you've given the planners some love and, you know, the Bubby's way and delivered on your key priorities. But anything you want to add? I, I think it's really it really is important around the planner role. Right. It's a it's maybe one of the more thankless jobs in a company because without having the support from the senior management team, without having the right technology support, without having this uh, forum every week uh, to be able to ask questions of the sales team or to be able to ask questions of the production team in a, in a way that's going to actually get them the information they need to do their jobs better, it is a thankless job. And so I think that's one of the things that uh, is most important about this implementation is we've elevated that role of production planner a bit. And we're giving them the information and the technology that they need to do their jobs properly. And so if you're experiencing a lot of turnover in your planner role or nobody ever wants to move into a planner job, you got to really look at, at how that job is structured and how it's supported and, and make sure that people are getting the information and the tools they need to be able to do their job effectively. And, and I think that's where Optimity was, you know, the Optimity selection was exactly the right fit for us, right? We could have just done a spreadsheet add-on and allowed the planner to keep their, you know, spreadsheet tools, but that wouldn't have got any of these results that we can talk about today if we didn't have that integrated system that brought it all together. And on Thursday, Wednesday morning, when we put the screen up, the Optimity screen up every Wednesday, and we look at how the revenue numbers are playing out for the quarter and the VP of sales nods his head and go, yep, that's my number. Then, you know, that just gives everybody the confidence that the plan that derives from that is aligned and it's exactly what we're going to do. And it has just made things a lot better in terms of me, me from a CEO standpoint, not having to chase down all these issues across functions because finance didn't know what production was doing or production didn't listen to what sales said was going to happen. We just don't have those challenges. (laughs) So that's a nice thing. So, you know, Jeff, I'm very proud of you because many leaders don't have the wisdom to know that balance in sales and operations planning is so essential, right? I just can't over forecast at sales and run my assets and run a good business. And and I think the more functional-based leadership tries to drive us out of balance. So let's wrap up here. What are your recommendations for somebody that's listening to this? Maybe they're a new CEO. Maybe they've got a mid to large company that they're trying to grow. What's your advice? Well, I think there's a couple of things around just being aware of how your system's working today, right? Where the, where's their friction? And if as a CEO, you're seeing friction between functions, then you got to understand what's driving the friction because fr- friction in a body leads to inflammation and inflammation leads to the body not working very effectively. And the same thing happens in organizations. And a lot of time it happens between the sales group and the operations group. So you have to be aware of how much friction there is. And then you have to you have to get set to be able to go address that friction. And, you know, I, w- I would tell you that we had friction issues. <laughs> you know, it's not uncommon, but you, you have to address the friction directly and you have to and you have to find the right tools and you have to find the right process and you have to have the right people. And then and then you can address the friction issue. But I think a lot of organizations just kind of shrug their shoulders and go, well, sales and operations have never gotten along. So they're probably not going to get along, you know, anytime soon. And that's that kind of a defeatist attitude from a leadership standpoint is just unacceptable. It, it can be addressed and it can be worked on and you can make it better. So that'd be the first thing from a CEO perspective. I think the second thing is it's just really important. I have I have like the best partner in the world from a CFO. So, you know, he and I are very closely aligned in terms of uh, it was not it, it was the right thing for me to do to 
to hand him the keys to the sales and operations planning process. And, and I think finance organizations in general need to step up and, and rather than be critical of decisions that get made about how cash is being spent, get involved in it and take, and take an interest in the process and figure out how they can be supportive of the sales and operations planning process in their company rather than just go, well, they're spending money again and I don't know why they're doing that or, well, you know, we had misshipments or shortages or whatever last month. And there's a defeatist attitude that sometimes comes along with the supply chain planning stuff because people have seen more cases where it hasn't worked than it has. And so that's why I appreciate you doing this, Laura, because I think it is important when you find those stories of where people got it right it's helpful for them to be able to understand what was it, you know, what, what did you do that actually made it right? Well, we picked the right technology partner. We got like-minded with the CEO and CFO about what we wanted to accomplish. And then we got people in a room and we didn't let them leave until we got it right. And I think those are the three, those are the three things that made it a success here. Well, and for most companies, they don't have that. Right. And so I applaud you, Jeff, for, the leadership of eliminating friction, driving alignment and balance, and really sticking to the basics of feasible plans and driving holistic balance sheet results. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank and you. it's my joy to bring you this story and I hope it helps others. Awesome. Thanks, Thank Laura. You. Yep.